for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. I mean, this uh, coronavirus crisis, this pandemic has a lot of downsides. One of the upsides is that I see people connecting more than they used to before. I've been invited to speak at uh, various events, user groups that normally I would never attend because I'm based in Germany and those user groups are in the US, in Korea or, or wherever. And at the same time, I get to engage with clients that are all, all over the place. So there are some upsides to, to, to any, any crisis, I think. So um, today's topic, let me quickly share my screen and then we'll find out what I will be talking about. I will actually, what, what Fadi just mentioned is actually the title of the talk. So it was not like keeping the title of the talk a secret. This is the title. Um, I'm going to test this hypothesis with you or um, this thesis that I came up with, which is we don't know, we never did and we never will, to describe a bit of the uncertainties that we face as, um, as human beings uh, out there in the environment that we're working and living in. And um, I will walk you through a, a chain of thought that, that I've been dealing with for many, many years. And hopefully, um, maybe this can inspire you. Maybe you take some insights from that. I will most likely not be speaking for a full hour. Um, I will be conscious of your time. I think for most of you, it's lunch break. So I hope you're, you're doing a wise investment with your lunch break and listening to this talk. And most probably I will be done after like 30, maybe 35 minutes. And then we have a bit of time for Q&A or you can get back to work um, a bit earlier than expected. So um, a few words about myself. Uh, Fadi already mentioned most of the most of the things, uh, the most important thing he didn't mention, um, I, 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 oh, I'm married and I have three little kids, which uh, give me a lot of joy and sometimes also a lot of pain. I didn't sleep well this week as an example, but uh, um, um, I think I'm complaining on a very high level. I am the founder and CEO of Scrum Academy, as Fadi already mentioned. I am a certified agile leadership educator with the Scrum Alliance, a certified Scrum trainer, and I'm also a strategizer coach. By background, this is a bit of the, the, the unusual thing compared to most people in this field of agile, especially agile product development. I'm neither from project management nor from software development. My academical background is in medicine. I'm, I graduated as a medical doctor from a um, um, university in Aachen in Germany, and did some um, stays in the US, worked at the University of Minnesota in a, in a healthcare facility there. And, um, but I never started, actually, after graduating, I never worked as a doctor. I joined Ben and Company as a management consultant. And from there onwards, I started my own companies, um, ultimately leading to working a lot in the agile space. And based on being a medical doctor, I do a lot of work also in the pharmaceutical and medical devices um, uh, industries, which is very interesting. Uh, in addition to that, uh, this is now my last year as a board member of the Scrum Alliance. I've served them for three years and I will end it at the end of this year to be a bit more focused on, on my family and also, also my own business. Um, one thing that I always teach um, or tell my students at the beginning is I, I'm never here to teach. Um, the reason I'm here is to make people think and I really hope the, the thoughts that are in my mind inspire you to think about scenarios differently. Maybe they help you solve some problems that you have, but it's not about me teaching you what to do. It's more about helping all of us and you inspire me as well to, to think about things in a bit uh, different ways. So why are we here? Um, my thesis is there's not much stuff that we actually know. And I've been dealing with this problem for many years. So I grew up in a, in a household um, after moving to Germany and taking some time to basically get settled. My parents ultimately uh, ended up having a, a house with a lot of books in it. So I always was surrounded by a lot of books and most of those books were from great philosophers. And this resulted in my father and myself having, as well, it was especially my father, um, having a lot of conversations about philosophy, about why we as human beings exist. And he never tried to force his own opinions on me. He, he much rather tried to for, help me think about the things differently. So basically the same thing that I'm trying to do right now. And, I came across one philosopher and his name was René Descartes. And I'm not sure to what extent you are familiar with uh, René Descartes, but he was one of those big existentialists. And what the question that drove him was like, how do I even know that I exist? And ultimately he came to the point. So he, there was a long chain of thought and ultimately, ultimately he came to the point was like, 
I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum in Latin. And this was his way of knowing, okay, I at least know that I exist. But most of the other things around us, we don't know. So starting out with this as a 12, 13, I don't remember exactly how old I was, this, this was stuck in my brain. And I always thought like, what do we actually know? What are the things that we know? And what are the things that we assume? And um, later in school, I, uh, I had a big interest in science, especially in natural science and also in mathematics. And the reason I later figured this out for myself was that in mathematics, for example, you had a lot of certainty. Once you understood a topic, you could prove things to be right or wrong. And when we talk about that in mathematics, we have so-called th so theorems. And any theorem is a non-self-evident statement that has been proven to be true, right? There are many ways to prove uh, those uh, theorems, but after we prove them, we know them to be true. For example, most of you are familiar, I guess, with the Pythagorean theorem being a to the power of two plus b to the power of two equaling c to the power of two. And this one has at least 370 known proofs, at least um, according to Wikipedia. So if there is something with 370 known proofs in a medical, math mathematical way, you could say, quod era demonstrandum, what I wanted to basically prove. And that makes it some kind of a fact. That makes it true. Now, if we look at the next type of science, which is the natural science, we see that there are scientific laws, like Newton's law on gravitation and a lot of laws about how gases act. And like even in medicine, we use a lot of these scientific laws. The interesting thing, though, is these scientific laws, they apply in a, under, under the same conditions. Right? So they always apply under the same conditions. You can't easily state that they are just true, right? Under the same conditions, they are true. But once you change those conditions, a lot of these laws also need to be adapted. It's this, that happens with gravitation, that happens with a lot of other things. The moment we change the conditions, the moment we expand to those conditions, a lot of the existing laws are not true anymore and they need to be adapted. And sometimes it takes us a long time to figure out the next type of law that would then apply under that specific condition. So these are scientific laws in physics, in chemistry, to some extent in biology and also medicine. But if we look at the next group of science, which is then the social science, we see that those social science models, be it like the Tuckman model when we, think, when we think about how teams act or a lot of other things, those models, they describe general trends or expected behaviors rather than being absolutes. So when we think about leadership or management or however you want to call it, or like how we work within a group, within an organization, we take a lot of these social science models and we look at them as something that is true. Whereas the reality is all of these social science model, all models only describe general trends. And in many cases, they describe averages, right? And this means they're not necessarily true. They can give us direction, but it's not necessarily, they can't predict the outcome of any situation. It's not the same as with scientific laws. And even with scientific laws, they were only true under the same conditions. So always keep those things in mind. So when we think about these things, it's very normal when we see situations like this. Everyone who is a parent, I'm sure you have experienced this. Right? You're going with your kid, you're going shopping, groceries, you're going through an aisle, and suddenly they start screaming. Or they're at home playing, and suddenly they start crying. So, and you don't really know what caused them to do this, and even worse, you don't really know what to do in order to stop this. Now, sometimes it's pretty simple. Yeah, you buy them the chocolate and they stop. But maybe in the long run, this is not, not so helpful, right? So if you think about the long term and you try to be a bit more strict as a parent, then you're like, okay, so what do I do right now? How do I make this kid stop crying? Or maybe you've uh, seen situations like this. 
where you try to put your kids to sleep, and I've dealt with this for the past eight years, and, uh, and then it works for two or three days, and you're like, yes, we managed this, it's done. And then the next day, it doesn't work anymore. And the kid, again, needs to get a bit more like body contact, needs to maybe sleep on your tummy, which means you can sleep, so the next morning, you are pretty tired. And with these situations, like looking at the kids, parental advice, etc., there are thousands of books, maybe even more, with X steps you need to take to achieve Y. And if you just look, I, it took me like two minutes on Amazon.com this morning, when I was like, uh, like putting babies to sleep, and immediately you find like clean sleep, my baby can sleep, or baby sleep training in seven days, or the baby sleep solution, all of those things where you, you think that these things will definitely solve your problems. You read the books, you're like, oh yeah, that's easy, let's do this. And then it maybe works, and in most cases it doesn't work. So why is this the case? Now in the world of Agile, and I'm quickly going to stop the presentation because I want to show you something in the, in the back that I have. Don't worry about the, the terms here. I didn't manage to, to create an English speaking chart. This is a German, so the X axis, the horizontal axis says what uncertainty, and the vertical axis, the Y axis says how uncertainty. Those of you who are familiar with the Stacy diagram, that's basically it, right? And we always say, if we have these types of, if, they, if we have this diagram, we can look at four different domains of work. At the bottom left, we have the simple domain, very little, if not zero uncertainty in terms of what to do and how to do it. And then we have the complicated domain with a bit more uncertainty. And then we have the complex and the chaos domain. And most trainers that I know, know including myself, we usually say this in this domain, what I've colored blue, you can apply so-called defined process control, which is the traditional way of managing a project where at the beginning, you can define or, or fix the scope of the project in detail, the time that you will need, and the budget that is going to be needed to basically deliver that scope. And we all say, yeah, you can do this. And the moment you get to complex or chaos with the amount of uncertainty being much higher, you can't do that, right? You can't predefine everything. You need to follow a more empirical approach where you can still probably fix time and budget, but you need to have variability on the scope. And you replace that detailed scope from here with a vision. And I always add the quote from Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, be stubborn on the vision, but flexible on the details, right? And it makes sense that what you try to do through trial and error, inspect and adapt, or an incremental iterative approach like Scrum is to systematically and frequently reduce uncertainty. That's basically what we teach. Now, the thing is, I believe with the what uncertainty, which is the products and services that we're going to build, and the how uncertainty, which is like the technology that we're going to use, but also the process, we are not capturing all the different uncertainties. There is so much more when you want, you, when you want to categorize work and domains of work than just looking at what is going to be built and how you're going to build it from a technical perspective. And I think it's those uncertainties that ultimately drive most projects independent from the industry, be it like construction projects, be it software projects, be it cars, airplanes, whatever, those projects consistently not delivering in scope, in time, and in budget. Now let's look at those, at some of those environmental factors. So number one, what we're missing is the human factor. I think we're not taking into account how human being behavior or the behavior of humans is not predictable. I mean, when this global pandemic started, I would have guessed people would buy masks. And yes, right, rightfully. But who would have guessed that for a virus that does not result in diarrhea, people will start hoarding toilet paper? And not in one place, and not just one human being. Everyone all over the world, people were fighting over toilet paper. Why? If this virus would cause diarrhea, I would get it but there was no symptom related to a higher use of toilet paper, right? So why were people doing this? And in Germany, it was especially bad. If you went to the supermarkets, two things were missing, noodles and toilet paper. 
And there were a lot of like jokes out there in Germany, like people are just sitting in their toilet paper caves and eating noodles. So this human factor is very unpredictable, right? We can't predict how humans are going to react to certain situations. And we also can't predict how human, humans are going to collaborate. We can, we can be down, we can be worse in our predictions. We could be too good in our predictions, which makes it ultimately very difficult to set like a scope time, especially in budget, when you have projects that require multiple people to work together. And the more complex the scenario, the situation is of those, people's work, of those people working together, actually it becomes less and less predictable. So if everyone is part of the same organization and you could say to some extent in incentives are aligned, probably collaboration is going to be easier. Now, if you have one of those large projects where you have different vendors participating in their organizations that usually compete with each other, not working for the same client, and you ask them to collaborate, it's going to be difficult because the incentives are also not aligned. So all of those things add. The human factor, I think, we're completely underestimating when we look at this Stacy diagram with the what uncertainty and the how uncertainty. The other piece, and I'm now showing you a picture of my beautiful hometown, Cologne. That's the cathedral, the, the dome, which was created over a period of, I think, more than 200 years. And it's always been under construction since. But the, the point that I want to make here is the environment itself. So during the Second World War, Cologne was one of the cities that was bombarded the most. So a lot of bombs were thrown uh, over the city of Cologne. Now, many buildings were destroyed, etc. But many bombs went into the, into the, like, the, the earth or, or, or the, 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 the ground, and they never exploded. And the consequence of that was the following. Ever since, so for the past 70, 80 years, and every time, more or less, where you have a big construction project, be it like an underground project, be it like a big new building, whatever, it happens more or less every time that suddenly they find a new bomb. Now, you can imagine, you can't just go and build a building on top of that bomb. You need to first take care of that bomb. And it takes a lot of time to remove that bomb. But would you guess that people, when they make the planning, right, this detailed scope for those construction projects, take into account that there could be a bomb and factor that in, in the time and the budget needed in order to drive or create, deliver that project? They never do. Right? Who would in the world would assume that there's a bomb every time you start a construction project? So those environmental factors, in addition to the human factor, they add to the uncertainty. Now, when we think about all of that, we have the uncertainty in terms of the products and services we want to deliver. So every time we start an innovation project, most likely there is some uh, uh, type of uncertainty. We have the uncertainty in terms of the technologies that we're going to use. Even if those are technologies that we have worked for or worked with before, putting them in use for a new product, there is some uncertainty. But I think the biggest uncertainty on the, are the environmental factors and the human factors. The more the team needs to collaborate, the bigger the uncertainty. And I think the bigger or the worse our predictability in terms of the future. Now, why is this important? I think two, thing, two things we, we need to take into account. One is we should cut ourselves some slack. It is okay to be wrong, right? We see this right now in politicians and fortunately, um, I don't wanna comment on the US situation because it's, I know there's like a lot of division going on, but if you look at Germany, we have a um, PhD in physics running our country, running our government, Angela Merkel. And She's a scientist. So based on her education, she gets it, right? And immediately from the start of the pandemic, she moved into an, a very empirical approach. She started to tell everyone, we need to look at things week by week and then make proper adjustments. And sometimes the decisions they took this week turned out to be wrong two weeks later. So it is right to be wrong. It is okay to be wrong as long as we are inspecting and adapting, right? As long as we have a process in place that helps us 
understand whether we're taking the right decisions or not, and then respond accordingly, it is okay if we are wrong, if we make assumptions, as long as we validate them. The other point is, it is still okay to believe in things, right? I don't want to make an argument that everything should be science, but at the same time, we need to be very, very careful to not mix beliefs and knowledge, right? And even if you think about knowledge, we started with philosophy, then we went to math, then we went to uh, natural science, and then we went to social science. Knowledge in each of those fields is different, right? Some of that is proven, some of it is not. And we also should not mix opinion with facts. And I think in a world where more and more information is being thrown at us, be it at work, or be it at home, in our private life, we need to be very conscious about this. And I always looked at agility as this key here, this empirical approach, this search for, no, for knowing stuff, this constant reduction of uncertainty. And I think if we consider ourselves as agilists, right? Maybe some of you don't, and it, that's also okay, but I always urge every agilist to try to become a promoter for this. Try to become a promoter, not for a specific framework, but first of all, for em uh, embracing uncertainty. It is okay to be uncertain. And then promoting tools and techniques that help us re systematically and frequently reduce that uncertainty. So uh, I have a final uh, thing then to close with. Now, when we look at all of this, all of this uncertainty, um, there are many, many stories in, our, in the business world right now as a result of this pandemic. Many organizations have been hit. Um, my own training company, we have been hit. Many of our customers, where we used to do a lot of in-house trainings, suddenly due to budget constraints, due to not wanting on-site trainings, but also not wanting to move to life, like pure online trainings, stopped working with us or at least put everything on hold. Like a lot of people, restaurants, etc., have been impacted. Very few companies have been impacted the same way as organizations in the travel industry. And I recently heard a podcast interview with Brian Chesky, the founder and CEO of Airbnb, actually co-founder. So he founded the company with two other people. Now, he was talking about Airbnb suddenly losing 80 to 90% of their revenue from one day to the other. Imagine your business, and some of you maybe don't even have to imagine because you've been in that position. I don't know. Fortunately, this was not the case for us, but in, for Airbnb, this was the case. Now, suddenly, you're like one of the hottest startups in the world. You're about to go public. You're about to like fill out everything with regards to getting publicly listed, and then this pandemic hits, and your revenues go down 80 to 90% you are by definition in this chaos domain. And what they described, how they responded to this was really taking a pure agile approach. They don't use the term, but it's a very empirical approach where you take one step and then evaluate whether we went in the right direction or not. Then you take the next step, then you take the next step, then you take the next step. And step by step by step, you figure out and you take, sometimes you take wrong turns. And that's okay as long as you act with humility, right? So you give yourself the right to be wrong and then adjust accordingly. Anyone who is interested in hearing his story, he can tell it much better than I can do. I'm more than happy to share that, uh, the link to that podcast episode. I think in the meantime, he has been on multiple podcasts. So maybe you've had already the chance to hear him speak about how Airbnb dealt with the scenario but it is a great example of how an organization dealt with enormous amounts of uncertainty. So two more things before I close. Um, two quotes that I really like, and maybe they also, um, I, I just leave you with them. One is from Picasso, where he was asked, um, how long did it take to become a master of your craft? And he responded, first of all, I'm not a master yet, but so far it took me a lifetime. And why do I share this? I think all of us being leaders in various situations, if you're leading yourself, if you're leading a team, if you're leading an organization, if you're leading a project or if you're leading a change within a company or within society, all of us 
need to be aware of the fact that we can't be perfect in leading. At the same time, we can't stop working on ourselves. So as long as we're constantly learning, and I mean, the fact that you're here probably shows that you're interested in learning. And we are, I think we're, we're going to be fine overall, but we need to constantly do this. And it's hard. I, I'm doing this constantly myself, challenging myself, challenging my assumptions to figure out like what could be the next step, next step for my personal growth and next step for my, for my organization to grow. And the last one is doing all of that, we should not forget that we also have a responsibility in, in all, all of our societies. Probably every single one of us that is in this call is much better off than most people on the planet. So I think it is our, our duty to some extent to, to try to think how we can make other people's lives better. And um, yeah, so with this I close, that was my hypothesis. We don't know, we never did, we never will, because we can't account for the human factor and for the environmental factors, in addition to the processes and also the products that we're building. So I'm a big advocate of, of following an empirical approach. And it was a pleasure um, presenting here. As mentioned, I, I finish after around 30 minutes, which gives us plenty of time to take questions or get back to our lives. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Saurabh. Excellent. All right, folks, uh, we're, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Just um, unmute and uh, take this opportunity to follow up with Surab if you have any questions. I, I don't have a question, but uh, when you were making that presentation, I was thinking you were actually describing a philosophy of life, not just, not just for work. Um, it was very nice. It was very good. Thank you. Thank you, Shagar. So uh, I'll yeah. ask. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Ahead. I just want to. I just want to thank you for presenting this. This is really good. It's good common sense, um, and I like the way it was presented. Um, the it it. So when you go into environments where, uh, say, management doesn't quite understand this, how do you typically talk through just some of these points to, to express to them that, you know, if you build a plan all the way out, it's not always going to be uh, fulfilled that way because things will change, the uncertainty? Yeah, so it always depends what kind of a relationship I have with that management team. So if I, if I have the, the, the ability or the relationship with them where I can go to, to this philosophical stage, I do that. But in most cases where I'm new to an organization, I just start with whatever they know. So I ask them, the last time you created a strategy, when was that? And they're like, oh, maybe two years ago. So to what extent did that strategy turn out to be right? And in, mo in many cases, they're like, maybe 10 or 20 percent then i ask them so how much time did you spend creating that strategy they're like oh yeah we hired mckinsey or whatever right and we spent that much money and we took that much time and then for 20 percent of it turning to turning to be to be right so what can we do about this is this the first time that this happened maybe it's just a one-off or is this happening systematically and if you take then the strategy and look at your projects right take a look at all the projects that you've run in the past year how many of them did come in, scope, time, and budget? They're like maybe 10 to 20%. So this seems to be a systematic issue. And then I asked them, very open and honest, do you want to address this? If you want to address this, we have a few tools in our, in our, in our bag that could pro probably help you. But this will, will always require significant work on your side, the way you lead, the way you structure the org, the way you like have KPIs defined in the organization, and also like a lot of things on, on the teams. And if you don't want to do it, that's okay. So what I can do is again, like I, I, I don't want to teach you anything, but I want to make you think. So I ask them these questions related to stuff that they're working on. And um, most management teams that I've been involved with, they're like, you're right. You're right. We've been seeing this and we haven't addressed it. And thanks for addressing it, first of all. And now let us think as a management team to what extent we want to spend time 
energy and potentially money on addressing these issues. And that opens up a foundation for further conversations. So Rob, I was gonna ask, you talked about the, uh, the what and the how, and then you added that you know, a lot of it is about the people and how they're gonna work together. Yeah. Have you given thought as to how that would be represented on, on the graph? Yeah. It's so, two dimensional uh, right now, so. Yeah, you, you, could, you could add a third dimension, which I think makes it difficult to draw. But uh, one of the trainers that I worked with um, during my own journey to become a certified trainer, um, Jürgen Hoffmann, or many of, him know, many of you know him as Mentos, he once gave me a quote from, from Stacy, and I'm not sure if it's right because I heard it from him. And he said, Stacy mentioned that if you look at these two, the moment you add the, the human dimension, everything is complex. And I think that goes in the, if that's true, if Stacy really said that, I, I think it's, it, it makes a lot of sense because the moment you add the human dimension, everything goes into here and you need then by definition, apply a different approach, completely different to what we've been doing. And I think most of the things that we've done as humans, and I'm not gonna say none of it has worked, but probably things could have worked much better, right? Even if you look at the history, like for the past hundred years, things could have worked much better if we had applied a bit more of that approach. And I think there are also organizations. So if you look at Jim Collins work with good to great and great by choice and all of those and how the mighty fall, when he talks, some of the organizations that he picked, they actually, if you read it, they apply a lot of this empirical approach and also a different type of leadership. There's another book that I recently um, listened, not read, um, it's called The Enlightened Capitalist. I forgot the name of the author, but it's amazing because he goes back 200, 300 years ago and talks about people that used to own companies or used to run companies. And they applied back then a lot of the values and principles that we talk about today in the agile community. And those companies had tremendous results, but due to us as human beings being, for example, greedy and not wanting to deal with uncertainty and all of those things, many of those people had to leave their companies or were fired as managers because the stakeholders, the shareholders thought if we apply a bit more rigid processes, we could even like get more profits out. And then all of those companies somehow went bankrupt. So there's a lot of literature around this topic and that goes back many years. So it's not a new invention. So taking this human factor into account, I think becomes more and more relevant, especially because more and more stuff is based on humans working together, right? It's not the industrial economy anymore. It's a creative economy, which means we need to put our brains together, come up with great ideas, write great code or create great products. So this human factor becomes exponentially more important than I think ever was. Excellent, thank you. So if there are no more questions, I think that's fine. Oh, I have a question. Oh yeah, go ahead, Diana. Yeah, so what do you see as the difference in the agile approach between complex and chaos? I've heard a little bit about the uh, this Sinophon framework, this yes. simple, complicated, complex chaos. And what I've most heard is that Agile really works in the space of complex. And then like maybe Kanban is complicated. And so I, I was just trying to understand from your perspective, what is the differences in Agile for yeah. you between complex and chaos? Yeah. So if you look at the, at the Kinevan framework or the Sinophon, as you mentioned, um, in complex, it says pro test uh, response, right? So you do a little test, an experiment, and, you, and then you get a response, and then you take the next step. Whereas in chaos, it says act sense response. So I always bring up the, as I'm a medical doctor, still by training, maybe 20 years later, I won't call me a medical doctor anymore, but I always bring up this medical example. If you have a patient, and that patient has a cancer, you would just go and not maybe do the big operation, you do a pro you send it to a pathologist, they take a look at it, and then you do a response, right? Whereas if you're a medical doctor and you're working in an ER and somebody comes in with a, with a gunshot wound, you're not gonna take a probe, you're just gonna do whatever it takes to stop the bleeding. 
So I think the intensity with what we do initially, that's the big difference between complex and chaos. And there are no, I mean, it's, it's all gray, right? There is no clear point where you're like, oh, this is chaos and this is complex. But I think those are the judgment calls where you're like, no, now we need to take a, a bigger leap, right? A bigger action rather than thinking about an experiment. And in the world of business, my guess is that in most cases, we don't really have that chaos. And this is actually something that I've been working on with my own coach. So when this pandemic hit, a lot of my habits came back. And I was trained as a medical doctor to be able to act immediately. So this emergency room situation, I've been in those many, many times. So they're like basically blood, blood and flesh, I have them. So what, what did I do? I immediately changed the strategy of my organization without even consulting my team, right? I didn't even take a day or two to talk to my team, get their input, maybe do a bit of experimentation around things. And I think in the business situation, it would have been absolutely okay if I take a day or two, nobody would have died. So I think in most cases, when we think about businesses that we're working with, we don't have this chaos situation that often. We much more often have complex, and that's why I draw it as the biggest one. So having this experimentation mindset is, I think, very helpful in, this, in those situations. Does it help, Diana? Yeah, I really like the clarification of the timeline and that how big complex is. So basically saying, oh, you know, you could spend four weeks or two weeks um, you know, interacting with your team, but you might think you're in chaos, but really you still have two days to kind of still, still be in that complex stage. But chaos is really like emergency room, gunshot exactly. wound. Firefighting. <laughs> my kid just fell off the step and she scraped her face. I need to react immediately and not consult my husband. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you're interested to learn more about this uh, uh, Jim added a link in the chat. A uh, link to a video. So if uh, you want to learn more about the <clears throat> the framework, uh, you can catch that video. Thanks, Jim. So Fadi, you're recording the session, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So it will be made available to everyone. And if you want, I can also share send you the PDF of my slides. That will be anybody, perfect. Anybody wants. I mean, it's mostly just pictures. <laughs> but uh, if you're still, I would I would share them with you, and you can distribute if. If yep. people are interested. We usually post the video along with the slides um, after the talk. All right, uh, last call. Any more questions for Surat? Not, not a question, but sort of like a, a comment. By the way, I loved the, loved the uh, session. Um, I, I, my mind has been busy though, trying to sort of link some of this stuff to sort of like the idea of entropy and how systems tend to go to chaos with time, um, just natural. Um, so trying to, maybe trying to find a link between what you were talking about, like how uncertainty exists and it will always exist and it will actually increase with time. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I'm, I'm not very familiar with that, with that theory, but I think, so there's this saying, um, the more I know, the more I know that I don't know. And maybe that's it, right? The more time you spend within a system, the more you realize that the broader your system thinking becomes, the more you realize how complex this actually is. Mm -hmm. So you approach things differently. And, and probably that's the link, right? Uh, the more knowledge we accumulate, the, the more we actually understand that we, we don't really know. And therefore we are then more open to, and, and I'm not saying this to make us feel stupid as humans, right? I'm saying this to make us embrace processes and approaches that help us create more knowledge faster, right? And don't be in that situation when we, where we have false certainty, because that puts all of us in a bad situation. If you're a product owner building a product and you give your stakeholders false certainty, they're not going to trust you. But if you're a scrum master and you're giving your team false certainty, they're not going to trust you. So, in order to make that human component work, right, going to Patrick Lencioni's work, trust is essential. And I think we get there by being transparent also about the things that we don't know, as long as we have a process in place 
that helps us reduce that uncertainty. So maybe that's the link, I'm not sure. We, we sh maybe we should <laughs> link up again and have, a, have a deeper conversation around this. Yeah, I would like that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining. Remember, our next event is going to be on uh, October 19 at uh, 5 p.m. We're going to have the talk first, and then afterwards, we'll have an opportunity to kind of uh, network and connect. Once again, thanks a lot, Saurabh. I'm so glad you were able to join us. And thank you all for joining us on this new lunchtime series of the DC Scrum user group. Thanks, Saurabh. Thanks, Bali. Thank you. I like the Thank you, everyone, for participating. Have a great day and a great weekend. Take care, everyone.